So chapter 7, Transmission Media. This is actually one of those important chapters. Here we talk about guided and unguided transmission, essentially wired versus wireless. Uh, we talk about the definitions and the forms of energy, background radiation, noise. And then we start getting more in-depth between the different types of communication uh, wiring or transmission types. Uh, so, 7 5, we start getting into our guided, more specifically our copper based portion. Then, 7 8, we get into our guided fiber optic or uh, optics. Then, after that, we get into our lasers and our IR or our infrared. Then, in 7 13, we get into our wireless or unguided transmission. Uh, within that, we have to talk about our satellites, and that's our geos, our leos, uh, our medium range satellites. And then about 719, we start talking about trade offs among the different types of transmission medias, trying to figure out which one's best. Then we kind of end with noise and channel capacity. So this chapter again continues our discussion within data communication. Uh, now what we're actually talking about the, the wiring. How is our signal going from one location to another? Again, that's going to be our wired, wireless, guided, unguided. We're going to lead into explaining how uh, shielding and forms of cable or forms of transmission media can prevent noise. And uh, again, we're going to end with the concept of capacity. So, first thing is, why or how can we divide our medias into different classes or categories? Two ways, the type of path or the form of energy. Or a combination or a hybrid of both of them. Uh, so this is actually how we get to our guided versus unguided. That would be our wired versus wireless. And then even under there, within our wire, we can actually classify them even more. Copper versus optics. Uh, underneath wireless, radio waves or radio frequencies versus satellite or versus laser or versus, well, laser's optical, sorry about that radio waves versus Bluetooth versus WiMAX versus satellite. I mean, there's other categories underneath wireless. It's not just wireless and wired. There's subcategories underneath both of them. Um, we're actually going to end with our satellites and our orbits, terrestrial versus non-terrestrial. So I'm going to hold off on certain parts of this, because that's at the very end. So here is a very basic, very basic breakdown of our types of communication, or transmission medias. Here we're breaking them down uh, from energy types. Electrical, light, electromagnetic. Underneath electrical, twisted pair, coax. You'll notice those are our copper based. Underneath our light, that would be our optics, our fiber optic, our infrared, our laser. Uh, lastly, electromagnetic, that's going to be our radio or wireless. And that's going to either be classified as terrestrial radio, radio on the ground, or our satellite, non terrestrial. I mean, even with these, we can break them down even further. Terrestrial radio, radio frequency, or Bluetooth. I mean, it just this is going to show you that we can break it down. It all depends on what's going to be the easiest way to do the breakdown. So when we start talking about copper specifically, we're going to talk about... Uh, the flowing of electrical current uh, and how it flows to complete a circuit. Essentially, there's going to be two uh, two wires or two uh, portions of a wire. One sends uh, 
the impulse and one receiving it. So that actually gets uh, to complete a circuit. Same thing in a typical house lamp. One actually sends the electrons, and one actually the electrons flow back. Now how these are actually protected is they're wrapped in a plastic coating to help insulate the electronic components of the wire. That way the wires themselves don't touch and nothing else uh, gets on the wire to impede uh, the signal or anything like that. So when we talk about computer networking cable or computer networking medias, we have to do what's called an alternate form of wiring. But before we understand, uh, before we can talk about that, we have to just understand a few other things. We have to understand that electrical cable actually radiate noise, and that actually goes out into the environment. That means that there's too many electrical cables close together. They're all radiating noise, and that noise can be picked up from other cables. When another cable gets the radiation, it can it can induce a small signal. Basically, the possibility of having too many cables close together and having one just create a whole new signal, it's possible. Not super plausible, but it is possible. And I have seen it happen, so we have to be careful of that. There are certain types of shield that can actually absorb the radiation, thus acting as a shield. So when you start talking about different types of uh, copper-based media, we talk about three major types, UTP, coax, and STP. UTP being unshielded twisted pair. That's what uh, most people are common, uh, commonly see or commonly deal with. Next, coax. That's, if you have broadband or you have cable, it's, you're pretty familiar with coax. And then last is shielded twisted pair. So the main differences between UTP and STP is UTP has no shield. STP does. So now that we have that basic understanding, we can actually look at why they're twisted. If the wires are not twisted, you'll actually see a source of radiation that there's going to be a difference in the cables. Versus, figure B, if they're twisted, there is no difference. If we match up the blue cable on the bottom, for example, plus 3, plus 5, plus 3, plus 5, and then we add up the gray, plus 5, plus 3, plus 5, plus 3, there is no difference, which means they are less susceptible to noise. Essentially, without the twists, when the wires are in parallel, there's a higher probability that the closer the wires are together, the more likely there's going to be noise from other wires' radiation. While granted, the twisting uh, pair does allow for some immunity of background radiation, it doesn't fix all of them, it's just some of them. If the intensity of the noise is too high, or if the cable is too close to other sources of noise, the twisting may not be enough. That is actually why we have our shielded twisted there. Just in case that the, the typical twist is not good enough, we have an additional step that we can do. Uh, what we could also do is use coax. One of the nice things about coax is it might not be as great as shielded twisted pair, but actually it has additional layers of protection. We have a center core, a copper core, then we have some form of plastic coating or insulation or cladding, then we have a metal mesh shield then we actually have a outer protective layer for protecting the entire uh, cable as a whole. 
that shield actually removes and mitigates a lot of the noise that this cable gets. The nice thing with the coax is you can actually put it in any type of environment and it would be okay. It's using that braided wire instead of a solid metal wire shield helps allow the cable to keep staying flexible. So again, one of the popular, uh, popular variations is shielded twisted pair. The shielding can either be a braided mesh or a solid metal shield like tin foil. But again, depending on our requirements, one may actually end up being less flexible. So, who makes these cable standards? I mean, we've been talking about UTP and STP and coax, but, I mean, who actually makes our standards for our cable? So there's big, there's big three ones that we have to learn. ANSI, which is the American National Institution, or American National Standards Institution, sorry, the Telecommunication Industry Association, TIA, or the Electronic Industry Alliance, EIA. So the last two you might see is EIA, TIA, or TIA, EIA. Doesn't really matter which one is first. But they actually jointly together develop a lot of telecommunication and electronic uh, industry standards. For example, our category uh, cable, our Ethernet cable, heads. The way that the pattern is laid out, laid out is it's an EIA, TIA standard. So, I mean, are there different types of standards for our category cable? Here's a common seven, no, eight, technically. Don't pay too much uh, attention to the data rate, because these data rates are way off. Cat5e should be able to handle 1,000 megabits per second, versus Cat6. That's 10,000 megabits per second. So, I mean, these numbers are slightly off. But the lower, or the higher the number, the lower in the chart that we go, Cat 5E, Cat 6, Cat, Cat 7, those are actually our newer cable standards. Those are what we typically deal with. In industry, normally we're looking at Cat 5E, Cat 6, or Cat 6E. Those are our big ones. So let's transition away from our copper into our fiber optic, or our optics, sorry. So if we deal with our optics, what three are we dealing with? We're going to deal with fiber optic itself, infrared, and point-to-point -point lasers. So all of these have one very big common thing together. And that actually is that on one side of the cable, we have something generating light, and on the other end of the cable, we have something that's light sensitive. These cables allow for one-way communication, so we have to have two cables to allow for two-way communication. Just like within our circuits, we had to have one for sending and one for receiving. Same thing here. So the next question then becomes, can light travel around a bend in the fiber? And so the interesting thing here is we're looking for a critical angle. And essentially, if light it hits one of the sides of the fiber at the wrong angle, then we have a problem. For example, we can actually have light reflect reflect so that would be section C, uh, and then it would actually bounce down the cable correctly. We could actually have the critical angle the wrong angle, and have it actually be absorbed into the side. That would be B. Lastly would be refraction. The critical angle actually is not correct, and thus leads to the light being refracted. Uh, thus leading to the light not going all the way down the cable. So reflection is the optical fiber 
the reflection is not perfect. The zigzag going down the media actually cannot go on indefinitely. However, it has been shown that the zigzag actually forces the proton to go a little further than if the proton was just shot down the center of the cable. The further the light goes, the more dispersion there might be. And after a critical point in time, the dispersion gets so problematic, you don't know if it was the data that was being sent was truly what was originally sent. Here's an example. Sent versus received. Received, just the degradation is so bad that you're not sure if that was a one, like it was an actual signal, or if there was just noise and then amplified. This is a huge error that noise can cause. When we deal with our fiber optic, we have two major types, multi-mode and single-mode. Multi-mode is less expensive and is typically used when performance is not important, meaning that it's the slower of the two, but it's cheaper. Single-mode is the most expensive and provides the least dispersion. However, it has the smallest diameter and it can go a lot farther, but it, it is incredibly expensive as opposed to multi-mode. So, again, the light being sent and received is typically some form of either LED or injected laser diode, some form of diode, and on the rece uh, receiving end, some form of photosensitive or photo uh, diode, something that's going to recognize that it's getting uh, light. So let's look at some of the pros for fiber. It's immune to electrical noise because it's, it's light, it's not copper based, so the electrical noise is not an issue. It can have higher bandwidth. That's very subjective because there's a lot. There's a lot of new articles out talking about higher performance uh, copper. So generally, though, fiber it can go further and can have more bandwidth. Though one of the biggest issues is cost. So again, optical is immune to electrical noise, uh, less degradation, typically higher bandwidth, though costs. Copper, it's cheaper typically. It normally uh, requires a lot less expertise and is a lot less broken. Uh, fiber optic, you can easily break. I mean, that's kind of subjective. I worked with fiber for a while and. Fiber, I mean, pretty durable. I mean, not super durable, but not, like, super rigid either. Though, when we talk about this, when we start talking about cost, you also have to think about the environment that you're putting it in. Is there going to be noise? Is there not going to be noise? Uh, is it going to be upgraded in a few years? So there's a lot of things to consider when we start talking about the type of transmission media that we're going to be using. Next would be our infrared. This is going to be some form of point-to-point -point, uh, higher frequency laser and it's typically used for TV remotes. Uh, it actually is required to be point-to-point, -point. however, it can reflect off of ceilings or walls Typical speeds, I'll let you read through them. So essentially the point-to-point -point laser communication is a pair of devices that allow you to, through a line of sight, share small bits of data. Uh, if you think about like the Samsung Galaxy 3, 4, or 5, 
if you're in close enough proximity, the touch option that allows you to actually touch your screen and you uh, beam or transfer a photo from one piece or one device to the other device, same thing. Uh, or if you have an Apple device, uh, AirDrop would be something similar to that. Uh, laser communication really works well if distance is an issue and you have proper line of sight. For example, two buildings uh, that are far away, if there's no it, nothing in between them, you can actually beam data in between them uh, instead of having to worry about some form of wire between both. Lastly, and the most common form of our media types are unguided or are wireless. With this, we start talking about predominantly radio frequency because that is our most common form of unguided transmission. And actually, most can argue that this is actually our most popular form of transmission media now. Uh, it's just, Wi-Fi has been on the rise for the last five, six years. And now with mobile devices being as strong as they are, Wi-Fi is pretty much taking over. Not in all areas, but for typical home users or mobile users, Wi-Fi definitely. So the benefits of Wi-Fi is it can penetrate uh, objects. It can go through walls. Uh, however, it does use a specific form of the spectrum, which means it can be susceptible to other forms of noise. I do apologize if you can hear all the background noise. Uh, there's a pretty heavy th uh, thunderstorm outside right now, so that's been fun times. So the next question then becomes, who allocates the frequencies used for our radio frequency? The FCC, or Federal Communication Commission, controls our frequencies. So let's talk about a little bit more about our F, uh, RF frequencies. And that's normally the frequencies between 3 kilohertz and 300 gigahertz. For most of the time though, it's better to see it representative as a chart. So, our 1 gigahertz typical range is our radio and TV. For example, the 102.7, uh, that would be in megahertz. That's a fairly popular, uh, well, at least in the west coast, that's a country station, pretty much no matter where you go. But above that would be our uh, microwave, and our infrared, and our visible light, and our ultraviolet light, and x-rays, and our gamma rays. But again, we're dealing with mainly 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. That's our radio and TV. It's always a good chart to kind of go slow on just because this is a really big thing. we actually are only able to see such a small portion of the light spectrum or the electromagnetic spectrum that we miss so much because we don't actually see it. Even just our radio and TV, that's such a small portion of it. Okay, moving on. Signal propagation. So when we start talking about propagation, we have to think about how is the signal going to reach the endpoint. When you start broadcasting, as it, further, it goes further and further and further away from the tower, it actually the waveform starts getting slower and slower and slower. Essentially. As you get further from the tower, the lower the signal strength. The signal strength will still be there a few miles away, just sometimes it's so low that we don't get to see it. Well, we don't normally get to see it anyway, but our devices don't detect it. But the signal is still there. Now, now we have to talk about two very big things, terrain. 
terrain is the Earth's surface. Our terrain can actually affect our wireless. It affects our wireless predominantly in the form of absorption. If our wireless gets absorbed into the Earth, it gets kind of get blocked. For example, I live in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is in a valley. So we have large mountain ranges surrounding us. If we try broadcasting outside of the valley, the mountains actually absorb our radio frequencies. So we actually had to put antennas on top of the mountains so that we could actually send out signals. Now let's start going into our terrestrial versus non-terrestrial. Terrestrial, on Earth. Non-terrestrial, not on Earth. That's about it. So let's talk about low range, medium range, and higher range. So depending on the range, we actually have the ability to get faster speeds. Higher frequencies mean better speeds. So that's true with almost all Wi-Fi. Now, since we talked about our Wi-Fi, we have to talk about one more form of wireless or unguided transmission. That's our satellites. So our satellites orbit the Earth. Now, the orbit can happen in very specific time periods. We can actually have a low Earth orbit, a medium Earth orbit, or a geostationary Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit means it actually can transverse the planet quicker. A medium orbit means it will actually transverse the planet a little bit slower. A geostationary means it will actually stay right above a specific point, period. Now, our most common one is going to be geostationary. Uh, if you think about our satellite companies, Dish Network for example, they actually have to have a satellite above a specific area regularly uh, versus I don't, know, I don't want to say spy satellite, but spy satellite or other form of telecommunication satellite that might circle the globe uh, because they're going to look at different portions of the globe in different areas where a geostationary one doesn't. It just wants to stay above a very specific geographic spot all the time. For our geostationary, normally they are at our equator and they stay stationary. Basically they rotate at the same speed that the Earth rotates so it seems as if they are there. Here's a great example of how we have both uh, ground and satellite and how that satellite actually allows for non-point-to-point so our receiving and our sending ground stations, they cannot talk to one another directly because of the curve of the Earth, but they can talk to the satellite, and then the satellite acts as an intermediary in between the two. Here is the math formula for the speed at which a satellite has to stay uh, going so that it can be part of a geostationary orbit. I've never ever had to use this. Some people might find it interesting, some people might not. It's there just in case you want to look at it. So how many satellites must we have to cover the Earth surface? The typical number is three. Though that's a lot of information to pass just between three, so minimum is three. That doesn't mean that three is the best number, it just means minimum you need three. Low Earth orbit we already talked about, that is a short delay, it travels faster. Though
The issue with here is because it does go faster, it can lead to faster communication or spottier communication. It kind of all depends on how you look at this. Oh, help us if I go forward, not backwards. So, moving on, we only have two more slides left, and this is one of, I think, the most important one. So, what type of media are you going to choose? And normally it depends on cost, data rate, delay, effects on signal, the environment, the security, your budget. Honestly, it's going to be based off of your situation. Every situation is different. Every situation might call for specific requirements. By far, that is more important than anything else. Every situation will be different. So make sure your situation is met by whatever form of cable, uh, whatever form of cabling that you're doing meets your situational needs. I apologize for that. Last slide that we got to talk about is our measuring transmission media capacity. So, what is our capacity? I specifically want to look at this slide. I don't really care about the noise slides. I mean, they're heavy mathematic based. Basically, the more noise you have, the lower, the smaller the capacity, which means you don't have as much capacity. That's essentially those few slides that we skipped over. That's what those state. So. The last slide is all about signal or channel capacity. The higher the frequency, the more data we can stick on it, which means the more data we can transfer. Higher frequency typically means faster connection. We're getting to the point where our wireless can be gigabit speed. Now that's theoretical right now. We're looking at 802.11 AC, AE, A something. Too many acronyms to remember. But it's the pre or it's the uh, post cursor after N, and they are actually supposed to be pushing almost gigabit speed. But just like anything else, it gets affected by noise. It gets uh, affected by the environment, and so it really all depends on your situation and how you're implementing it. That's really it for this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any comments on how I can make this better, again, please let me know. I hope you had a good time, and thank you. Have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Chapter 9, Transmission Modes. Part of this chapter, we're going to be talking about the tax uh, taxonomy of transmission modes, uh, more specifically going into parallel versus serial transmission, uh, transmissions, uh, bits and bytes, timing, uh, asynchronous, synchronous uh, transmissions, uh, RS-234 slash COM ports. We're going to go ahead and end with our duplexing and our DCE and DTE equipment. Uh, the DCE and DTE equipment is very important for serial connections. So, again, we're Continuing on with the lecture on data trans, uh, transmission terminology, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of parallel, parallel and serial, and go over synchronous versus asynchronous. So what does it mean by transmission modes? A transmission mode is the manner in which data is sent over the underlying media. This happens in one of two ways serial or parallel. Serial is one bit is sent at a time, i.e. what ends up happening is it does one task at a time and it doesn't move on to the next task until that first task is fully complete. Uh, serial can be broken down into synchronous versus asynchronous. Parallel is the next transmission mode and that's where multiple bits are sent over the same time. So a graphical representation of that would be this. Parallel versus serial. 
Serial, again, is one task at a time. Uh, the subcategory is for serial or asynchronous or synchronous. So when we start talking about transmission, it really is important to find out what are we transmitting. Uh, if we're talking about hard drive technology, our serial hard drive technology, our SATA, serial ATA, is actually a faster technology for sending data than it is via parallel, our PATA. Uh, I know this is more about our layer one, but that's always kind of a good reference. So again, our parallel transmission does allow for multiple data sets to be sent over a separate media at the same time. So how this works is we have multiple pathways between the sender and receiver and it allows multiple bits from different areas to be sent over. This is parallel. Uh, however, the our diagram did omit two very important areas. Uh, all parallel wires that carry data. A parallel interface usually contains other wires that allow the senders to receive and to coordinate, i.e. they are allowed to send and receive simultaneously. Uh, this type of installation is, uh, does allow for better troubleshooting. Also, our parallel mode of transportation has two main advantages. In this type of transmission, it's higher speed, and it has to match underlining hardware. Uh, again, the underlining hardware has to be able to send and receive data in parallel. As opposed to serial transmission, one bit at a time, though the nice thing with this is it can go longer distance, it costs a little bit less, and it only needs one physical connection. A big part of this is it sends one bit at a time, and thus the logic of it can focus all of its resources on sending that one bit. Here's our graphical representation. Again, it shares a single media. Uh, it can share two, that way it has one sending media and one receiving media. The data does need to be able to uh, transmit it between serial and parallel, parallel serial, back and forth. Uh, normally our chips that do that are our universal asynchronous receivers and transmitters, our UARTs, and there, then there are our US arts, universal synchronous, asynchronous sender receivers. That way we have one that can do just synchronous and one that does asynchronous. Uh, so what is the transmission order? Should we be sending data over uh, significant bits or least significant bits? MSB versus LSB? It all kind of depends on the type of technology or system that we're using to send it, but there are differences between the most significant bit and the least significant bit. Either can be used, but both sides have to agree. Uh, this is actually one of the odd PowerPoints, because if we're looking at bits, it's little b, talking about bytes, it's big B. And normally when we start talking about bytes, that's dealing with storage, not transmission. When we talk about transmission, we specifically use bits. For example, your network is 100 megabit, 1000 megabit, 1 gigabit. When we talk about storage, we use bytes. We have 100 gigabytes. We have a thousand gigabytes. We have a uh, one terabyte. Bytes are used for storage. Bits are used for transmission. That's a big thing to get. Uh, how do we send the bits? 
How do we know which ones are the most the most significant? So if we're talking about Ethernet, we normally separate them in groups of eight into different octets. Here we have four bytes or four octets. First byte is our eight bits. Second one is next eight bits, nine through sixteen. 17 through 24, 25 through 32. This is four groups of eight. This is the beginning of basis for our IP addressing. Uh, if we're talking about groups of eight, you can call each group instead of a byte one, byte two, byte three, byte four, octet one, octet two, octet three, octet four, or the first octet, second octet, third octet, fourth octet. Language is a big thing, so I, I wanted to point that out. So, how do we deal with timing? How do we make sure everything is going according to a correct time? Asynchronous is any time, while synchronous has a continual time. There is no gap between transmission. And so, synchronous is a curler, it does occur at regular intervals, which means there are fixed gaps, fixed pathways. So these are our three most common ones. So again, asynchronous transmission happens at, uh, happens at any time. Uh, that means you don't have to worry about any type of idle, because for it to be idle, it's kind of arbitrary between transmissions because the transmission is happening at any time. Uh, one of the problems is asynchronous can uh, have problems when there's a lack of coordination between the sender and receiver because the sender can send at any time, which means the receiver always has to be listening. And then there has to be additional error corrections just because it doesn't know if, uh, when it's gonna get it. So things like that has to have additional bits and a start bit just so that the receiver knows where it starts, where it ends. And that's just one of the bad issues with our asynchronous. Versus synchronous, which is doesn't suffer from that disadvantage. Next is our RS-232 slash COM. And that is our standard. We actually don't really use RS-232s as much anymore. That's a traditional serial or COM port, a 9-pin DIM. So how we actually look at that is, here it is in voltage. When it uh, increases the positive 15, it does the initial start. Uh, if it is positive 15, it's representing a 0. If it's a negative 15, it represents a 1. And that's the representation. Next is our asynchronous, er, sorry, is our synchronous transmission. And again, synchronous means the data is continual, which means that there is no gap. It is always sending. Here is our representation. Here Again, negative 15 is 1, plus, plus 15 is 0, but we're going to be doing groups. It has to know what our groups of 8 bits is, because 8 bits make up 1 byte. So if we're trying to trans transmit like byte 1, we have to have a start and an end so that the system knows which bits are there. So that brings us into how do we do those groupings? They're done in blocks and or frames. The answer lies within the, the ability to use framing. Framing actually groups in our 8 bits into one byte, but it's a specialized code so that it recognizes what portion is the frame. Here we have the start of one frame, which are denoted as three continual ones. We have 8 bits three dots for our completed frame. That way it knows it has the start, 
and an in, and it recognizes how to do that. Now, uh, last is our ISO synchronous transmission, and that is to allow for a steady bit flow. One of the inter interesting things here is it's a steady rate flow. Things that need uh, less noise, less jitter, things like VoIP or voice, uh, that way it can, can guarantee a specific delivery. One of the last major things we talk about is our duplexing. So how do we send? How to receive? Can we do it one time? One way? Both ways? Do we have to share media? Uh, normally I want to use like a surface street for example. Is it one way traffic flow? If so, that's simplex. Uh, that means it only can flow one way. If traffic can flow one way or the other way but only once at any given time it's half duplex so that's like when you come to a road and there's construction there's only one pathway but the construction workers actually control traffic that way one uh, set of traffic can go when they're done the next set goes back and forth never allowing both sides to go at once only one side is allowed to go at a time that's our half duplex. Next is our full duplex and that is you can send and receive simultaneously all at the same time. Here's a graphical representation. Again, uh, simplex, one way. Half duplex, it's send or receive. Never both at the same time. Full duplex is one and the other. It's si simultaneously. Uh, if you look at copper, you'll notice that there are always, uh, they come in pairs, one for sending, one for receiving. If you look at fiber, same thing, there's one for sending, one for receiving. Half duplex does have its uses, but I mean, it's kind of limited. We've already talked about our half duplex, and that is again, it's one or the other. And there has to be something there so that it can coordinate who's going to send, who's going to receive, and at what time. And how do they know who's going to be sending at what time? Okay, so the last major area for this chapter is our DCE and our DTE. So with our serial connections, we have to denote something that's going to control our time. So our DCE, Data Communication Equipment, and our DTE, Data Terminal Equipment, originally done by AT&T, and is normally done for serial connections. Here, this is what actually is setting our clock rate, our timing. One of the big things here is our DCE, controls the clock rate. The DTE is just getting the time from our DCE. So when we program serial connections, the side that's controlling our time is our DCE. For an for a academic standpoint, we have to make sure that our DCE Again, it's the ownership of the, our time. It's the con thing. It's the portion that controls our timing. It's our time master, if you will. If you take any of the networking slash Cisco courses, our DCE is extremely important because again, that sets our time. So time in what regard? That could be time for our modem, time for our terminals, time for our serial interfaces. It's just dealing specifically with our timing. And that is chapter 6 in a nutshell. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. 
remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual so if you're not sure how to do that go online uh, you can type in APA formatting uh, if you don't want to look it up online you can go to any of the tutorial services we have a writing we have a library service they can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting that's important that's not going away uh, in discussions same thing we have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations we're building off of other people's works so it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature so when I say something at the sky is blue you can take my word for it or if I provide a citation you can take an expert's word for it and then I built off of that so it just kind of increases your credibility we should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible because again we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature same thing in our IPs every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source every paragraph is an idea and every idea we need to have support within the literature and I know at this level it's not that big of an issue but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work it's second nature also length we don't need posts that are great job I mean don't get me wrong it does add to it but when I start grading for posts I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs I don't count the great jobs as a post for our discussion board I'm looking for three solid responses with citations uh, for our papers I'm looking for three pages of content with citations so what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic that's not a cover page that's not your reference page that's three content pages uh, two if you're really good but I'm really looking for three if you're doing uh, diagrams diagrams totally are okay as long as you're doing them within APA formatting lastly grading again I grade off of heavily off of attempt like if you're putting an effort into it like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort I'll, I'll meet you but if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation you know that really isn't you making an effort uh, if you get stuck don't get me wrong some people a page is a lot if you get stuck you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper you can contact me I'll help you if you don't want to contact me we have a writing uh, center we have a tutorial uh, tutorial center we have plenty of help for you to get if you need tutoring there's a lot of tutoring out there and uh, again provided from the school all you have to do is say something for our tutorial lab we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL we have tutorial services for database we have tutorial services for math English writing research library services I mean we have a great amount of tutorial services and if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area you can ask for it specifically and they will find tutors for you so you cannot use you cannot get tutoring because you can if you ask for help the school will get it if you cannot get it from the school there's other help I will sit down with you I will do as much as as much as I can with you if you need one-on-one -on -one. if you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring that's not a failure on my part that's not a failure on the school's part that's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there you have my number you have my email 
You have two emails from me. You have my cell phone number. You have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help, that's on you. That's on you. Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.